Welcome to the Dead Harvey Podcast. This is Brad. Today I have a very special guest, independent filmmaker, Gorilla Metropolitania. This guy makes some crazy stuff. Now, um, you remember those like uh, videos from the 80s, kids don't do drugs, dare to not do drugs. I have a way for you to feel like you're on drugs without actually doing drugs. A safe way to do drugs, just watch Gorilla Metropolitania's movies. Um, he's, got, <laughs> he's got several shorts on here. Welcome, uh, Gorilla Metropolitania. How are you today? Very well, very well. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> so how long have you been making movies for? Um, I actually started about a year ago, to be honest. Mm -hmm. uh, my first thing I've done is a short film called Bits, which is on my YouTube channel, which, um, which has been filmed entirely uh, in the middle of a lockdown, national lockdown. Oh, yeah. um without any permits in an apartment block in east london nice. literally nice. so we brought the desk uh, the telephone the chair a fake plastic panel and uh, in the middle of the night uh, there was you know uh, an entry which we could use to get access and uh, and we filmed the whole thing in three and a half hours with the actress which i only met a few hours before and we were talking silently no noise whatsoever because um we could not afford to be caught by yeah. the occupants and uh, and we shot the whole thing purely with real filmmaking style without permits without anything you know legitimate <clears throat> and um and that was my first thing i've done and uh, within a few days when i put on youtube it went vital and uh, it's a kind of slasher, uh, but very arty. And, um, you know, and, um, and that was the beginning of my journey as a filmmaker. I wanted to create something um, just different. But I think that uh, the obsession of visuals um, was pretty much um, natural because there's so much I can tell without the use of dialogue. And I, I wanted to create something that will um, represent fear, madness, uh, perversion, uh, horror. Um, you don't need words for that. Um, if you can give to the audience that, and at the same time, make a point if you want to talk about social madness, for example, or addiction or uh, anything, you can do it through horror, but you don't need words. And that's what I've been trying to do um, from that point on. Yeah. Go ahead and describe like your style, like what your influences are from or, or exactly like what your style is, how you would describe it to the audience. Um, well, I think um, it varies because uh, definitely expressionism, German black and white expressionism is there. <clears throat> um, Andy Warhol's pop art also is there. Uh, 70s American porn, which I mentioned in my previous interview, Gerard Damiano, Deep Throat, that kind of stuff. Uh, in terms of visuals, definitely is there, that kind of kitsch look from the 70s. Uh, grainy looking picture kind of thing and uh, French cinema um, the new wave um, Nobel Vague as they call it in France but even Italian films from the 70s and you know exploitation films from the 70s and early 80s um, American films uh, again B movies primarily um, so I'm referring to the early um, filmmakers from the 70s the new Hollywood um, you know, a, a number of things, paintings also as a form of language, which is incorporated in my films. Uh, the censor, for instance, it's filled with uh, painting style um, imageries, uh, you know. Um, so uh, again, uh, my idea, Brad, is to, um, is to go to the heart of society and show what society looks from down below um yeah, yeah. I, I 
well, at least that's an attempt, my attempt of doing that. There are many other filmmakers, great filmmakers. Abel Ferrara is one of them. He's oh, been yeah, doing yeah. that. He's been doing that for decades. Uh, but I have my own approach to uh, storytelling, and um, I rather um, have two actors or two actresses uh, simulating sex uh, and then getting killed. Uh, you can hear the noise of both the sexual act and the killings, but you don't need to hear what they are saying. So that's pretty much where I'm coming from. You don't need to know what they're talking about because there's nothing to talk about. They are having sex and then they're killing each other. Um, all you hear is noise. And that noise, in my opinion, is far more powerful than 16,000 words. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and I think it is an accurate reflection of the asshole of American society, or as in London, I guess you would say it, the arsehole. Uh, but because the, the uh, asshole and arsehole of society keeps growing wider each day. Uh, but, but no, I think you really nailed that. But no, the, I caught a lot of those influences. And I caught, so this is what I caught. I caught like uh, silent movies, um, 70s movies, uh, the Giallo movies, those, uh, the Italian horror movies from the 70s. And then the French New Wave stuff, I noticed that as well too, because they do like, they do like a lot of the, like the close-up shots. And I also noticed, uh, so I didn't get, I, I didn't pick up on the German expressionism, but now that you mentioned it, I totally see that. But yeah, and then the paintings, because you also use like, um, it's cool because you also incorporate a lot of multimedia into your movies as well too. And I think that's pretty awesome. Um, so talk about your idea of incorporating multimedia or like um, what you want people to get from that approach to it as well. Uh, again, we're going back to uh, my, um, okay, in every single, so far I've done four works, three short films and one medium blend films. However, they're all different, but there's one common denominator, and that is the, the perception of the underdog. The underdog is what prevails. Um, <clears throat> uh, in my special superhero, for example, uh, you see the girl talking to the nerd, Rufus, uh, from the top, uh, as if he's nothing. Uh, that's a perception uh, that I'm trying to give to the audience as you know, um, the underdog is now dealing with the situation. You know, the sensor, the same thing. You see the old man approaching the camera full of bodily fluid liquids on him. And you you can feel his omnipresent, powerful uh, presence as if the young man is nothing. Um, so again, we're talking about the, how the strong prevails on the weak. In my films, there's no heroes and there's no good ending. There's no room for heroes because I don't believe in heroes, Brad. I, I never believed in heroes. I always believed in uh, hypocrites and victims. Mm. Um, you know, and, and what better platform than filmmaking to do that? Um, my special superhero, uh, it, it's pretty much a big F off to a society which is basically all about image and glamour and superficiality and individualism and by doing that we create monsters uh, every day we are creating new monsters and once they become real monsters and start doing strange things with, with the human body well that's pretty much a consequence of what we have done now obviously in that case it's very obviously you know it's a drama also is, is over the top you know but at, at the end of the day, we create monsters every day. You and I, we do the same thing. So, and my films are not meant to be educational. It's just my personal point of view that says, look, I think horror can also be used in those terms, uh, where the real horror is actually the human being. Um, the, the, some of the stuff that you see in the sensor is pretty terrifying really i mean you, you can imagine an old man like that doing that kind of stuff to a young man which is muscle you know full of muscles and fit and, and yet he can't defend himself because again power is the true motive the true the, the, the true element how the powerful can submit to any desire the underdog the underdog are fundamentally dog food 
to be given to the next lion and then you know and the same is for the other short films in bits for example the woman um you know she we don't know nothing about her and yet uh we don't sympathize for the victims that's the bizarre mm -hmm. thing the, the victims are already dead even before they get killed because they are nothing yeah that's great oh uh, that's a great answer you have some pretty fascinating answers um yeah that's cool i think it's like so i i watched these twice and i watched it the first time i was like what is going on what am i watching and then it was just i was trying to like sort of like put these things together and then when i watch it the second time what i think is cool is because of the and like taking like you basically like doing your point of view but it's also sort of an objective approach too. you're not like making any statements directly which i think is great you let the audience decide that for themselves and i yeah. think that each time and especially like using like the multimedia and like the silent movie approach every time you watch it you get a little bit more out of it that's what i noticed when i watched them again i was like i'm getting some more out of this picking up more things on it so i think that's really cool i love that kind of like that overall well i guess like in the sensor there's more of like a narrative approach but it also is is mostly silent aside from the narrator uh but uh but I, I think that's a really cool, unique style, and I haven't seen it used for a while, especially when you're incorporating all these multimedia elements on top of it. Um, but I think it's very effective. And uh, tell me about the the whole like London underground indie filmmaking scene there. How does it differ from like what you've seen or experienced in American movies, in American independent movies? I think because now it's all global, I think uh, what I've noticed <clears throat> on both sides, uh, not only here in London, but also also in America, um, they're using more and more filmmakers. They are using independent um, short films, for example, more like um, more like a tool uh, mm -hmm. to use to go to the next step. They yeah. complete. They try to make independent films look almost like mainstream films. Uh, and that to me is not really a good thing um, because the whole fascinating aspect of filmmaking when it comes down to independent filmmaking is you have to tell the difference between a low budget independent film and a mainstream or traditional film. That's what makes the difference between the two things. Otherwise, you're just trying to copycat something with a lower budget. And that is what I've noticed. Um, for example, I'll give you an example. Um, going back to the 70s, you have, uh, I mean, American filmmaking, you have masters like Toby Hooper. Oh, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. You know, Toby Hooper never tried for once uh, when he got started with Texas Chainsaw Massacre. He never tried to, um, to make a film that would look almost like a Metro Goldwyn Mayer film, but horror. He knew his limitations in terms of budget and he exploited that limitation in order to get as much as he could out of it. And that's why the film to this day is monumental. If he was trying to, if he tried to, <clears throat> to copycat a horror film, mainstream horror film, uh, probably the result would be very different. And what I've seen today, many filmmakers, independent filmmakers, they try either to overuse CGI, which in my opinion is not good. CGI is good if you use it carefully in a balanced way. Because the difference between CGI and analogical effects, if I can use that terminology, CGI tomorrow, there's a new software. So what you've done yesterday, it will appear to be dated already. Yeah, because, it, yeah. because it's computerized. If you use analogical effects, uh, you don't have that problem. It might look a bit cheesy, but it doesn't look dated. I'll give you an example. In bits, you see a human heart on the floor pumping. Well, that's a real uh, heart, not human, obviously. Uh, we went to, to the local butchery shop and uh, we just bought a couple of um, uh, sheep um, hearts. And, oh, yeah. and, we used, and we used them. So what you actually see in my short film, bits, it's an actual heart 
animal heart. And then obviously we put something to make it, you know, to pump it and to make it look as if he was still pumping. But again, that's a real heart. It's not CGI. So that is another problem that I keep, that I keep seeing today in, in many independent films because they don't have the budget. They try to replace that with an overdose of CGI. And what you're seeing is not really a horror film, it's more like a technological, technical film um, that might have some horror in it, but ultimately it's more like a video game because you see CGI all over. You see, you know, monsters created by CGI uh, in 3D. You have no depth with the actors. Um, you know, it, it looks fake. I mean, I think independent filmmaking should be more about you, Brad, and company. You got yourself a camera. Where do you live? In uh, Louisiana or you live, I don't know, in the Bronx? Um, just go there and start shooting and see what comes out of it. And then you can filter everything through the editing process and post-production and you can, you can be creative but use your creativity as a filmmaker. Don't, don't try to find solution, easy solutions with technology, which is there simply to help filmmakers, not to replace what they don't have or don't put in a film, if that makes any sense. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely, it's kind of mirrors actually what we've been talking about. Like, so, uh, especially when you're talking about the original Chainsaw Massacre, Hooper was not trying to imitate everybody, anybody else. He was just trying to do his own thing. I think it's important in indie movies, and I think it's really cool that you mentioned this, to do what you want to make that you haven't seen before, but you want to put out there as opposed to imitating something else. And with practical effects, I'm so much more into the movie when it's practical effects than I am when it's CGI. I instantly kind of find myself taken out of the movie, unless it's used to sort of complement it like Jackson did with the original Lord of the Rings movies where you get those close-up shots that were all practical and the makeup and everything, and then the farther away ones, it complemented it. Now, unlike the later ones, like later Hobbit ones, it was obviously a lot more CGI and didn't work as well. But I think what you're saying is absolutely true. Like, make what you want to make, what you haven't seen been done before, with your own spin on it. Because look at what's happened with all the remakes of Chainsaw. Yeah, How ineffective yeah. they've been. Aside from, like, I mean, I, I dig three and I dig two a lot. But the other ones that go past that, it's like, they keep getting more sort of like saturated and Hollywoodized. And, and it's a very important thing to distinguish yourself from Hollywood movies and to make yourself something. Because there, obviously there's no point of being an independent filmmaker if you're not gonna distinguish yourself from Hollywood or try and mirror Hollywood. Yeah, do your own thing and let them imitate you. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a great point that you brought up. Um, so you're working on a feature right now. Um, it's called Darius, tell us about that. Well, that's, that's an interesting one. <laughs> uh, this time will be, uh, well, mm, not for YouTube, but the aim is distribution to put it on the market and, and you know, DVD, but also to put in some digital platforms. Uh, the film is my first feature film. Uh, the main actress, um, she's a famous Italian um, actress in many Italian independent horror films. Her name is Ilaria Monfardini. She's been in quite a few low budget Italian horror films. And um, at the editing, there will be a guy called Fabrizio La Monica, which is uh, also a filmmaker and editor. He's done uh, quite a few films, uh, very good filmmaker, uh, but he's also a very good editor. So they will be both in the film as performers and plus Fabrizio La Monica will be also working as an editor also. Um, they will be coming from Italy here in London um, this summer, September, after summer, sorry, September, um, for quite a few days uh, to do the shots. And the film is about a maniac uh, hanging around here in Essex countryside. Um, and then how this maniac, um, his journey, basically crosses the path of this middle-class family. Uh, they just, you know, uh, lost uh, their child and how the two, the maniac and the family, you know, they embark in a journey uh, of a very, very hellish night. 
Um, the film is extremely intense, uh, and there are some very disturbing scenes, and I mean really disturbing. Um, so obviously, it's not a film that I can even dream of submitting to platform like Netflix or <laughs> Prime. Yeah. Um, nowhere near. In the film, you got you got necrophilia, you got cannibalism, incest. Um, you got quite a few things going on in the film. Uh, but again, it's not gratuitous. It's not just for the sake of it. The film ultimately is about loss and what the human soul can do looking for something and what level of depravity and horror people can actually uh, go under in order to feel the emptiness. So it's a very psychological film in that respect, without being uh, uh, pretentious, without being uh, kind of, uh, again, educational. Uh, but the film is about the horror of the soul. Um, there's, you know, it mentions, uh, although very vaguely, suicide, uh, various things of the dark aspect of the soul and um, very ambiguous sexuality. Uh, very ambiguous uh, and like I say the, the film is it's simply shocking from from a human point of view is really shocking and it's entirely visual there is no one word all you hear is screams laughter crying um, noise music everything but not words and, oh, cool. uh, and, uh, and you will be spending the whole film, which is basically a whole night, next to the maniac. And we don't even know in the film, the film, you, you, are, you will have to watch the film, but Darius, you will have to work out who Darius in the film is. The film does not tell you because no one single character in the film has a name. So Darius, you, you, will, have, you will have to work out who Darius is. Oh yeah, that's cool. I love like the idea that you're that you're still doing kind of like that silent movie approach, but you're using not dialogue, but you're using like the sound effects. That's pretty cool. I like that. Yeah. So are you? Um, I think like the most difficult. Well, actually, people think that the most difficult part of of uh, movie making is making the movie, but I think like equally as difficult is like marketing, distribution, trying to get your movie out there, trying to find a platform for it. Uh, talk about your. Um, your approach or your strategy with this movie and any kind of like advice you could give other people for that? What I found out recently, um, just to give an example, <clears throat> uh, the industry does not have any problem with blood. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. <laughs> yeah. You know, they don't, mm -hmm. they don't have an issue with that. Obviously you're not gonna, mm -hmm. you're not gonna hope to put, you know, uh, um, a gory horror film in the same digital platform when they are, I don't know, playing, I don't know, Mary Poppins. So it's, it's very unlikely. Uh, yeah. But 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 you're gonna have some space somewhere where digital platforms of that kind will buy your product. They don't have any problem with blood, but they do have problem with explicit sexuality. I totally noticed that too. Like it, it was like when you watch mainstream stuff like Walking Dead, and I was seeing like it, it's been progressively like, especially on like TV. It's yeah. I don't know how it is like in uh, in London, but uh, in the states, like with TV, it gets progressively more violent. But they still very much shy away from nudity. Like Walking Dead, they started showing uh, carnage, like I had seen in Italian horror movies. You know, like when a splitter goes through somebody's eye and it's the close. I was like, this is stuff that I used to watch when I was in college. And we thought that was the most craziest stuff ever. And they're showing it on regular TV now, but you're absolutely right. They still do completely shy away from sexuality. That's true. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Darius, it's filled with that, literally. And um, in the sensor, it's still kind of um, replaced by various images. And, and yet you can, you can clearly feel the penetration that goes on in the film, the rape. Um, but in Darius, 
uh, nothing is left to the imagination. And yet, <clears throat> and yet uh, it's not shown as if, here we go, watch this. Uh, no, uh, it's shown pretty much like um, under the same, um, I guess you can call it subliminal, mess subliminal messages that you can see fragments of few um, seconds, not even that of what goes on. So your brain is memorizing the information, but your eyes don't. Yeah, that's cool. So I'm, I'm using mm -hmm. that technique mm -hmm. in Darius, uh, uh, and I use that in a very clever way. So the audience will know 100% what goes on, and yet your eyes won't be able to actually mortalize the moment, but your brain is recording everything that makes any sense at all. Yeah, definitely. It totally reminds me of, you know, like when, when Chainsaw, the original Chainsaw first came out, uh, Toby Hooper was trying to get a PG rating for it, and <laughs> which is hilarious. But he did, actually, the, the amount of violence that you see on screen is very minimal, but the tone of the movie is pretty brutal. Yeah. Um, and I've heard somebody say they thought it was a comedy. I don't get that. I mean, the second movie probably, but uh, it's a very disturbing <laughs> comedy. But the first one, no, um, not to me at least. <laughs> I was I was so scared when I saw the first one that I was like looking in the back of the car. I was like driving yeah. around. I was like I was totally freaked out. It freaked me out for a while. That was one of the first. That was one of the first um, horror movies I had seen. And but yeah, it really had an effect on me. But but you're absolutely right. Your brain is connecting the dots because in chainsaw when he throws him on the meat hook we throws that guy on the meat hook when leatherface first comes out towards the beginning there and he closes the door behind him you don't actually see the guy connect with the meat hook yeah and in scarface and the chainsaw attacks and you don't actually see the chainsaw attacks him. but those are two famous like hollywood examples but they're using an independent style for it and your brain mm -hmm. is connecting the dots so people actually think it's a lot more brutal than it actually is but yeah no that's a very good point yeah uh, that's cool. I think that's good strategy also. The other thing about that is he's shot uh, with two different styles. It's um, it's partly meta cinema, which basically is uh, when the maniac is filming himself during the night with his little camera doing things, but not in a way that you will see before, like the found footage kind of stuff that you see around. It's basically this maniac, which has the brain of a three years old boy. No, oh, yeah. He's a, you know, and he talks with a child's voice and he drinks milk and, uh, and he eats chocolate and he, he actually acts like a child, but he's not a child. And he does things that are simply, you know, beyond words. And, uh, and he walks around, you know, tearing people's scalps off their heads and put on himself. Um, you know, a very weird kind of character, uh, uh, you know, and he's filming himself doing things. So the film is shown with both styles from his perspective, you know, from his camera, hand camera, and from the outside, um, you know, angle, you know, you know, uh, static shots, you see what goes on from the outside world and then from his camera. And then you have two different visual, two different styles throughout the film that go on and, you know, in terms of visual narratives. And, uh, and when things happen, you are not anymore the audience, you become him because the, um, the shots are filmed in a way that the viewer will become uh, the maniac. So the, oh, things, that's cool. the, thing, the things he does mm -hmm. to this family, it's not anymore the maniac. It's you. If this makes any sense yeah. at all. Yeah, I like that. I think that's a great idea. I think that, um, and this is kind of like segues into what I was gonna, what I was gonna ask you next is that um, the kind, I think like the independent movies that work the best really stick out in your mind. Um, you, you know, you notice like movies that you see and they get like a lot of hype or whatnot. You watch them and it's just like they leave your brain for after a week later. I think your movies will definitely stay in people's minds. And uh, so the uh, other question, this follow-up question is, is, is basically, what's the main effect that you want people to get from watching your movies? To be honest with you, Brad, I, I, never, I never 
I never see myself uh, as someone that has, you know, something to teach to anyone. Uh, you know, I, I just want to tell stories in my own little way. I, I you know, I don't regard myself as, a, you know, I don't take myself too seriously. I take my work quite seriously, that yes, but I don't take myself too seriously. I want the audience to watch my cinema, my films, uh, in this case, the feature film, you know, Darius, which will be out hopefully, uh, well, this, at the end of this year, and just see, uh, the, you know, a different way of doing films, uh, which is not for everybody. I mean, people who like perhaps a more kind of um, traditional kind of horror, probably they will look away because my, my films are not the most commercial one, so to speak. What I've noticed, um, people who tend to appreciate my work are kind of ambiguous kind of fan base that people like from David Cronenberg to Erotica, um, you know, a, a mixture of fan base rather than uh, the typical uh, fan that goes out with Michael Myers mask on. Right, uh, yeah. You know, uh, and, and, and I like both. I like, obviously, I like, both sides of the spectrum. But what I did notice that people who like my work are fundamentally people who, are, who can appreciate horror, but they do not belong to one specific uh, umbrella. Yeah. They, they, they wave around between certain type of horror, certain type of dark erotica, certain type of arty kind of stuff. And, you know, um, just, a mixture of things, but they are not as in, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, people who go crazy for Hostel, for example. I love Hostel. I mean, I think it's a great film. But yeah, people, too, yeah. People, people who go crazy for Hostel, for example, they tend to look at my work with suspicion. But people who might like a razor head, David Lynch, uh, or some maybe Cronenberg stuff, not that I have. I mean, th these guys are giants. I can't even polish their shoes, <laughs> not in a million lifetime, whatever. But the point is, maybe somewhere around that, it's definitely more possible in terms of appreciation rather than the more kind of classic kind of horror, if I can use that word. Yeah, definitely. That kind of, that also reminds me of, um... I think that's a great approach too, is just sort of let the audience pick up what they want from it and let, and I think like a lot of people that are into horror movies, but different kinds of horror movies, different movies in general, will pick up those different influences that you put in there and, and appreciate it more. Yeah, but the mainstream audience will probably look away. Yeah, exactly like you're saying. That's yeah. what they're saying about the about the new Cronenberg movie, The Crimes of the Future. People are like, oh, this is some weird shit, man. People like, so he did some you know, mainstream stuff like History of Violence. And uh, some of those other movies around that a couple of years ago, basically ever since existence, he's been making more mainstream stuff. Now he's going to return to form with Crimes of the Future. And that's what people are saying. They're like, if you're a fan of like the older Cronenberg stuff, or you pick up on kind of more overall um, artistic influences in, in horror movies. And if you're a fan of like, uh, basically like video, I, and I'm a fan of his older stuff, like video. Yeah. I, I dig History of Violence. I dig his new stuff, but. I really love I really love video drone and naked lunch and uh scanners. Oh yeah, scanners is fantastic. Yeah, there's so many the, it's really cool to see a return to form and him not giving a shit about like whether the mainstream audience is going to pick up on it or not. But it also, I think, hitting your kind of like fan base there, the people that are really into that stuff. I think that means that you just increase the amount of appreciation people have for it, as opposed to doing something like halfway or not taking like a specific approach to it or trying to be more mainstream. I think it's more effective for the people that actually appreciate that stuff. Yeah. That's why I'm you excited know, about the new Cronenberg one. See him go back to his old form. Yeah. An interesting thing that I noticed, I mean, there was this guy from American actually. Um, and I remember this guy very well because he looked like one of the ZZ top guys. <laughs> yeah. Uh <-huh. laughs> you know, the long beard he was just full of tattoos, you know, huge guy. Um, clearly. A huge fan of heavy metal and the uh, hardcore horror, you know, very, you know, um, powerful kind of horror, you know, very bloody and, you know, guts and kind of stuff, you know, and, uh, and he wrote to me some, some time ago on social media, privately, and he say, hey, man, um, I watch your work, and uh, I watch my special superhero and also the censor, 
um, I want to say something to you. And I was like, okay, go ahead. Then I was expecting, you know, um, you know, not criticism, but, you know, maybe um, an opinion that was not too favorable. And he said, look, I watched the most gory stuff ever, and I never felt so disturbed when my as in watching your stuff oh wow i mean uh, i mean the sensor i could feel even i could smell the stench of that shit hole where that thing is going on you know mm-hmm. and yet i can't smell because it's a film and yet i can imagine the stench of that shit hole down the basement i can smell the, what the guy's doing even you know you 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 are you're able somehow to create a level of realism and just disturbance. And, and that to me was a compliment. And actually that is a compliment. <laughs> he said I was just me. gonna say, that sounds like a pretty good compliment to me. Yeah, yeah. It is a compliment, but again, it's a compliment only if you, if you go beyond the surface. Yeah, yeah. Because That's the true. sense yeah. of before, before it becomes horror, you have to wait at least 25 minutes before the sense of becomes really dark. Prior to that, it's more like, what is this? Yeah. You don't even know what that is. But then after 25 minutes, 30 minutes, you go, hang on a minute. This is getting darker now. It's getting darker and darker and darker and darker. Yeah. You know, and then you realize, uh oh, he's raping him. Yeah, you know? I so. yeah, I noticed the beginning that was like uh it was like the PSA is almost on like the authoritarians and they're like, okay, we want we want this society to be perfect now and here's how we're gonna control you. And then it definitely makes that shift. Yeah, it definitely yeah. makes that shift. But I, I picked up the same thing he did. It was like you can re- and that's one thing that you get from indie movies that you're never gonna get from a Hollywood movie. A Hollywood movie will never be able to replicate that. They were bringing in all these art decorators to sort of make it look like that as opposed to just filming in the actual place. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I picked up on that, that. And that's where I think like indie movies really work, like the grittiness and griminess and like keeping you in the movie and much more involved in it. It's so, and especially since, you know, and I think there's a psychological component to it too. When you know that somebody's making an indie movie, you know that like a lot of people aren't, aren't there. You know, they're probably doing guerrilla stuff and you know that they're probably getting away with something that they that they uh, should not be getting away with and you're like they're stealing that location or whatnot they're really in there you know that they're really in what i'm trying to say is you know that they're really in the moment when they're making that indie movie and as an audience member that's what you pick up on or i picked up on definitely i think that's what he picked up on as well too yeah it's also a matter of what kind of people you're working with for example the uh, going back to darius uh, is the first time they're actually casting a stage actress uh, because prior to this point, actors and actresses in my films, they were just colors for my painting. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is the first time where actually actors and actresses, they are a lot more than just that. And Ilaria, which is, um, you know, an Italian actress, she also has her own, ra- her own radio, uh, Radio Saigon, in, 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 you know, exclusively about horror stuff. Uh, she's gorgeous she's as hot as you can possibly imagine uh very talented and the first question i asked her is ilaria can you give me everything up to the fifth gear for this film can you push the boundaries can you push the envelope i really me you know i really want you to push the envelope can you do that for me this is way beyond your stage training and she's been playing supporting roles in other Italian horror films recently, but this time is different. She will have to play visually and she will have to push the envelope, even in terms of sexuality and, um, you know, and twist and psychosis. Can you do that? And she said, yeah. So it's when you are using the actors, the actresses, really as tools to really push the envelope. Uh, in mainstream, uh, it's practically impossible. You're not gonna, because everyone is worried of losing um, an audience or getting involved in politics or having problems with, um, you know, with the establishment in general, because it's, it's very hard for me to see Steven Spielberg now doing 
a film like, I don't know, um, let's just say Abel Ferrara, The Bad Lieutenant. I can't right. picture, I can't picture Steven Spielberg today doing a yeah. film like that. Not because yeah. he's not, I mean, he's, Steven Spielberg is one of the greatest filmmakers in history, but the point is, will he do that? Yeah. The answer is no, not because he can't, it's because he doesn't want to. Because Again, we're talking about two different universes. Abel Ferrara, even though now he's making completely different kind of films, we all know that if he wants to come back to the bad lieutenant or the drill killer kind of stuff, mm -hmm. he can still do it. Uh, mainstream filmmakers, they will never do it because once they become mainstream, they don't want to go back to independent. Abel Ferrara, just like many others, they can you know, dance around the two you know, without any yeah. problem. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, they need money. They do the high budget stuff, and they they want to do like whatever they want. But I think it's big. I think it's, and we know that Spielberg can do gore because we all saw us having Private Ryan. But I, I think yeah. you're right. It's just because he doesn't want to. Yeah, I think the closest we got to the indie you should style. watch. You should watch Steven Spielberg. You should watch an early seventies film, which hardly anyone knows. Oh, uh, was that the, the Duel or before that? Before that? No, no. Oh. It's a, it was a made for TV film, horror from uh -huh. 1972. It's 1972, yeah, and it was called Something Evil. Oh, you know what? I have checked I've, it out. I, I heard that he <laughs> had something before the duel. Yeah. That's cool that you brought that up. But that name, I think I've heard of that before, but I don't remember that. I would definitely, I remember going, you know, I'm going to check this out, and then I didn't, but I'll definitely check that out uh, after that. Sounds cool. Yeah, Something Evil. So it was like a made for TV movie, right? Before the yes, duel? yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, that's great. No, I, I, yeah, it's funny that you mentioned Abel Ferrara because there was a talk about movies that stick out in your head. Bad Lieutenant's still in my head. Like when I watched um, when I was in college, there was a kid he wanted to disturb. He was in my, you know, like uh, on my dorm room floor. He wanted to disturb other people. So he'd just leave his dorm room floor open and he would have five minutes of the most disturbing scenes from the Bad Lieutenant. He'd just clip them together and have them in a loop and he'd just leave the door open and he'd just play it. And he'd have the TV visible so that when people walk past the door, they would see it. <laughs> I would just go out in the hall and just watch people's reactions because it was hilarious. He was getting a kick out of it. Uh, but no, yeah, Ferrara's, yeah, Ferrara's like that. He does some really cool stuff. We will probably see him return. To, I think he's one of those guys, like you're saying, that will probably return to form like every now and then. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in my opinion, Abel mm -hmm. Ferrara is, is a genius. He's, oh, he's, he's awesome. Not, yeah. He's not a filmmaker that who is afraid of. Um, he's not doing films because he's expecting the audience to. Right. Yeah. He's not doing like um, others in the business. He actually does his stuff. He makes his film, and they say, "Okay, if you guys, if you if you like it, cool. If you don't like it, that's not a problem. I I still like it." Yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. You yeah. Know? It, you know, it's a. Uh, it, it really is a free free filmmaker intellectually artistically totally free it's a free you know yeah is free i think that's the ways. best i think that's the best thing about independent movies is the liberation from you can do whatever you want if you're not worried about like anybody else like trying to control like what you're saying or the platform or anything else like that or like holding the purse strings on the money you can do whatever you want did you yeah. did you find it did you self-finance this new one or did you do like any kind of kickstarter for it or D uh, Darius, you mean? Yeah. Hmm? Uh, Darius would be completely self-financed. Oh, awesome. Uh, so you really can do what you want then. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, self-financed. And um, I mean, obviously it's low budget, um, but the film will cost about four grand, roughly, between four mm -hmm. and five grand. So it's not much, but for me it is because I'm oh, saving yeah. I'm saving a lot yeah. just for this. And, uh, and these along with the following one, uh, which will be in about a year and a half time from now called The Benefactress and will be my only two feature films. And then I will return back to short films for YouTube. Um, but those two will be my actual feature films out on distribution on DVD. And on both films, I will, well, Darius, of course, but possibly even the benefactress, I'm planning to cast uh, Ilaria as one of the supporting roles. The second one will be a lesbo horror film, um, very explicit, very controversial. And uh, again, sexuality, sexual violence and horror and social commentary as in power 
uh, powers that be, it's mixed to a degree that is fundamentally shocking. Shocking. I, my, I use cinema, Brad, more like a rifle. Uh, I use cinema as a weapon to, to sentence to death in my films the very people I can't stand in society. Yeah. 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 So, nice, safe way to do it. Yeah. Anything deplorable, as in sexual violence and sexuality in my films, is becoming more and more predominant, as in sexual perversion. I'm talking about. I'm not talking about Ryan O'Neill and Ellie McGraw kissing each other and saying love is never to say I'm sorry. That's not the type of sexuality I'm talking about here. I'm talking about ugly sexuality, rape. Um, you know, I'm talking about something that is really disgusting. I use that as a tool to say these are the people that I personally hate. And somehow those are the people who are in charge. Hmm. Yeah. So, and again, it's not meant to be like uh, some kind of um, uh, statement, if I can use that word at all. It's just my way to say, okay, deep in my heart, the more you present yourself as respectable, the more I hate you. <laughs> yeah, I think that, yeah. Because, not mm -hmm. because you are respectable, it's because mm -hmm. I can smell hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I meant. Uh, often, the, um, the scruffy looking guy is the one with the most gentle soul. It's true. And, yeah. uh, and the one that presents himself or herself as God on earth. Uh, mm, you should watch out. Yeah, but the, you definitely have a good point there. Yeah, awesome, man. Well, those are some fantastic answers. Um, so yeah, wild stuff. Check out uh, Gorilla Metropolitanius movies. It was fantastic talking to you. Uh, let us know um, where we can check out. Let's let the audience know where they can check out your movies. I'll also put the the links for them in the show notes on the podcast as well too. Yeah, uh, I have my YouTube channel, which is. We're in the Metropolitana. I'm also on Instagram. All the gotta do is just uh, even on, on my YouTube channel uh, for each short film, you will see uh, down below the link of my Instagram profile, which is clearly, um, you know, on each short film on YouTube. You can see also my Instagram address, so people can uh, get in touch with me through Instagram as well if they want to. And uh, yeah, so. Cool. Well, I look forward to uh, checking out your new movie, Darius. Keep us posted on when that comes up, and we'll we'll post updates on it as well, too. Thank you, Brad, for having me, and uh, thank you so much again. Cheers. Yeah.